South America is the perfect place to keep secrets. Its jungles, mountain ranges and river systems are daunting obstacles for any explorer. It is a continent that has beguiled adventurers for centuries. Something hidden, go and find it. Go and look behind the ranges. Something lost behind the ranges, lost and waiting for you. Go. Kipling's poem is especially apt because this is Colombia, the land of El Dorado, home of the legendary Kingdom of Gold that in the 16th century lured the conquistadors ever deeper into the heart of South America. I'm Jago Cooper, and as an archaeologist who specialises in South America, I've always been fascinated by the secrets and mysteries buried deep in these awe-inspiring and forbidding landscapes. The history of this continent has been dominated by the stories of the Inca and the Spanish conquistadors. But in this series, I'll be exploring an older, forgotten past. Travelling from the coast to the clouds in search of ancient civilizations as significant and impressive as anywhere else on Earth. Here, in what's now Colombia, live two of the most extraordinary societies in the New World. The Muisca and Tyrona shared language and beliefs that underpinned their cultures for a thousand years. But it was their exquisite gold artefacts, infused with intriguing meanings, which drew European invaders into their remote lands. In this program, I'll be discovering how two extraordinary cultures rose to power. What the gold that so bedazzled the Spanish conquistadors really meant to these people and how it was that fate and circumstance would see the Moisca and Tyrona take very different paths into the future. The beaches of Colombia's Caribbean coast are beautiful almost a cliché of a tropical paradise. But for me, its rich past is what makes this place so special. History flows through Colombia. For 12,000 years, it was a corridor connecting the pre-Columbian populations of Central America, the Caribbean, Amazon and Andes. And a 1,000 years before the Spanish arrived, the Chibcha-speaking culture from Central America spread southwards to this land. Chibcha was a language shared by different communities scattered across part of Central America and what is now Colombia. Around 700 AD, two of these communities expanded into highly organized societies skilled in agriculture and goldworking. One of those cultures, the Tyrona, established themselves in the mountains of the Caribbean coast. Another, the Muisca, settled 500 miles to the south. They developed independently for centuries, free from outside interference, but in 1492, that began to change. Christopher Columbus discovered the new world for the Spanish, and in the years that followed, the conquistador's influence spread, threatening the existence of the continent's indigenous cultures. In 1537, conquistador Jiménez de Quesada set off in search of an overland route to the newly discovered Inca homeland of Peru. With an army of 800 conquistadors, he struck deep into the heart of Colombia, with no idea of what he was about to find. The expedition took more than a year to carve its way through the jungle, up to the high plains and valleys of the interior. One of Quesada's men described the journey like this. We endured a great many hardships on the journey to the new kingdom, as much from having to slash new paths through the mountains and hills, as from hunger and sickness. And we arrived in this kingdom naked, barefoot, and burdened by the weight of our own weapons, all of which had caused the deaths of a great many Spanish. Three quarters of the Spaniards died on the nightmare journey. Those that survived 
found themselves in a new and alien world. The Muisca were one of the largest indigenous societies in the whole of South America. From the mountain tops, their territory stretched beyond the horizon, occupying an area larger than Switzerland. A land where gold seemed to be everywhere, but a society unlike anything the Spanish had seen before. The Muisca weren't ruled by a supreme leader in the same way as the Inca and Aztec empires. In the Muisca world, no one person had absolute control. Instead, the Muisca territory was organized into two large federations, one in the north and one here in the south. When the conquistadors arrived, the Muisca population is estimated to have been about half a million people, most of whom were living in small villages. The Spanish chose one of those villages as the site of their first town, and that town has grown into Colombia's sprawling capital city, Bogota. In the 16th century, Muisca settlements were spread all across this valley, but little evidence of them is left here today. So if I'm really to understand how Muisca society operated, I need to look outside the city and travel 30 miles to the north to one of the few remaining Muisca sites still standing. One of the big problems with trying to understand how the Muisca society operated is the fact that very little remains of their architectural structures. They built with wood, which has since rotted away. So there simply aren't the houses, temples and meeting places left to find that we can study and understand them better. Except in this place, where the Muisca broke from tradition and built from stone. The Spanish named it El Infiernito, the Little Hell, because they believed the rituals practiced here were the work of the devil. Archaeologist Karl Langebeck has carried out many excavations around El Infiernito. Walking through this site, it is a very strange place. It is indeed a unique place in the Muisca culture. There is no place like this. Uh, there is some indication that during the last years before the conquest, the Muisca elite was beginning to relate itself with the sun. And there are evidences here of an uh, astronomic observatory that probably had something to do with following the path of the sun. Standing in the site, you can't uh, ignore these giant phallic symbols in the landscape. What do you think the origin and meaning behind this is? Well, there is a lot of speculation, but it is, I think it's safe to say that it has something to do with fertility, which, is called, of course, is also related to the sun, and it's also related to the activities of the chiefs and religious specialists. Carl's investigations indicate that there was a deep connection between the Muisca and their environment. And while there was no king ruling over all Muiscan people, it seems each community did have leaders. And the relationship between ordinary people and their chiefs appears to have been an intriguing one. Spanish documents clearly point to the fact that there was no notion of private property. There was the notion of communal property, yes. Um, the lands belonged to the community. I think the chiefs were the guardians of uh, precious uh, objects, gold, um, precious stones, uh, food, cotton, things like that. Uh, but I think there are no good evidences of uh, properties um, in the hands of chiefs. What do you think that tells us about day-to-day -day life of the Muiscans mm -hmm. here? Well, the prestige of the chief was very much related to the ability of providing good feasts to the community. When the Spaniards arrived, they described this um, tradition among the Muisca to pay taxes to the chiefs. But when we investigate about what the meaning of paying taxes was providing food that actually was transformed by the family and the wives of the chief to provide feastings, 
feasts to the members of the community. Carl's excavations have revealed another unexpected twist to the unusual relationship between the people and their leaders. At his lab, he showed me two skeletons unearthed at a Muisca site south of Bogotá, dating from the 1300s to the arrival of the Spanish in the 1500s. Altogether, some 700 skeletons were found, and genetic analysis of the remains has helped archaeologists understand how Muisca society operated. We have focused our analysis on trying to identify differences between the so-called rich people and the so-called poor people, people with a lot of stuff in their burials, like seashells and gold and things like that, and other people without offerings. And what lessons do you think you've started to learn from that? Well, I think one of the most important lessons is that, yes, there was social differentiation, of course, but it, it was not inherited. We have carried out genetic studies on the members of the elite, the members of the community buried with stuff, and there are no relatives among them. And that's very interesting. And so if you're telling me that it's not genetic and not inherited, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how do you think power is earned? Well, I think every, every, every single shred of evidence points to the fact that power was negotiated. Powerful people had to convince other people with good argument, not just by inheritance or the use of force. This remarkable research makes the Moisca seem almost democratic to modern eyes. There must have been an incredible sense of community. But this site also points to a society whose every move was governed by their relationship with their gods. Legend tells that here at the Tekendama Falls, the Muiscan god Bochica saved the people from drowning during a rainstorm by splitting apart the mountain and letting the floodwaters drain away. But what Bochica could not prevent was the Spanish onslaught that was just about to rain down on the Muiscan people. What had caught the eyes of Quesada and his men was Muiscan gold. Everyone, commoner or chief, in every village and town seemed to have artefacts crafted from the precious metal. Rumours quickly spread far beyond the New World that there was a vast city of gold somewhere in the mountains. The legend of El Dorado was born, and in the years that followed, waves of treasure seekers descended on South America in search of the fabled land. But El Dorado wasn't a place, it was a person. The literal translation is the golden one, a ruler so rich that it was said he covered himself in gold dust every morning and washed it off in a sacred lake each night. One conquistador told the story thus. He went about all covered with powdered gold, as casually as if it was powdered salt. For it seemed to him that to wear any other finery was less beautiful and to put on ornaments or arms made of gold, worked by hammering, stamping, or by other means, was a common and vulgar thing. If El Dorado was a person, did he exist? In the heart of Bogotá's bustling streets, one place offers a clue to the origins of this most enduring of myths. So we're just going to the uh, Gold Museum, which over the years has built up the largest collection of pre-Columbian gold artefacts in the country. Bogotá's Gold Museum is packed with fantastic treasures. But perhaps the most incredible of all is the magnificent golden raft of the Muisca. Archaeologist Juan Pablo Quintero explained that it appears to capture a moment in an ancient waterborne ceremony. 
the very embodiment of the El Dorado legend. Who do you think that character is in the centre of the raft? It is probably the chief, the representation of a chief. Uh, it is well dressed, you can see the ornaments. It's bigger than the other characters, so it's a high ranked character. So probably it was the chief. The chief stands in the middle of the raft, surrounded by 12 smaller characters. All of them are adorned in gold ornaments and feathers. Some carry musical instruments or wear jaguar masks. The smaller ones on the edge of the raft appear to be rowers. So if we start to think about the El Dorado myth, this myth of a man dressed in gold, do you think this raft proves that to be correct? It does not prove it directly. I, I mean, that's not direct evidence or archaeological evidence of the myth. But it is very suggestive that it's a raft and that represents a, an important ritual. So you cannot think anything else but El Dorado myth. But other, less literal interpretations of the myth are held by the descendants of the Muisca. They keep ancient traditions alive at Laguna Guatavita, a sacred lake in the heart of Moisca territory, northeast of Bogotá. Watching over the lake today and waiting to greet me is one of those descendants, Enrique González. To welcome me to the lake, Enrique performed a greeting by blowing on a conch shell. Shells like this come from the coast more than 500 miles away and were highly prized by the ancient Muisca. As the sound of the conch reverberated around the lake, I asked Enrique what the golden raft meant to him. Para usted piense que esto estuvo en cosa que han pasado acá? Sí, mira. La balsa es algo que simboliza la unión que había, el vínculo que había entre el Muisca y la madre Guatavita y el agua. Efectivamente, acá era donde se hacía el rito, en la balsa, para adornar, para nombrar ese, ese cacique. Evidence supports Enrique's explanation. Spanish chroniclers described ceremonies taking place here, and small amounts of gold have been discovered in the area. Like many myths, El Dorado may contain a kernel of truth. It supports the suggestion that the Muiscan people, unlike the Spanish, valued gold in spiritual rather than monetary terms. Nosotros, ali, la, los actuales muiscas, como nuestros ancestros, para nosotros el oro no significa más que una forma de pagamento. Es lo que está allí, lo que simboliza esa laguna, ese consejo espiritual, esa conexión espiritual, ese consejo, esa palabra está allí. Ese es para para el Muisca es el más grande tesoro que está y debe permanecer allí. Las piezas de oro si están o no están para nosotros no simboliza riqueza. It was great talking to Enrique. He gives a real sense of connection between the ceremonies which are carried out here at the lake and the people of the Muisca. In a way, the way he talks about the Muisca of the modern day and the connection they feel for the ancient Muisca, it provides a sense of identity that is completely connected to place. And it makes you feel like this place is special. Whatever the truth about El Dorado, archaeologists have discovered another dimension to the role that gold played in the culture. When the Muisca raft was found in a cave south of Bogotá in the 1970s, it was inside a pot containing small, flat, gold figurines known as tunjos. Many of these objects are displayed behind glass at the Gold Museum. But Juan Pablo has arranged for the vaults to be opened so I can take a closer look. And it's immediately obvious that each of them represents a different character. I really like that level of detail you can see on each particular artifact, and each of them is very individual in how they're made. How do you think the different elements that you see is representative of different people? 
you can see like the chiefs, you can see the priest, as here this one have, if you see, it has a head in their hand. So that's telling you that's a warrior. There are other noticeable differences in the Tunjos. You see the difference between that color and that color. Here you can see there is more gold, but in this more brown one is because it has uh, a lot of copper more than, than this one. And that is not by chance. They, they decide to do that, to do that way. Mixing gold with copper in different proportions, Muisca goldsmiths could vary the color of the finished tunjo. And, unusually for gold artifacts, the tunjos have flaws, spurs of excess metal and unpolished surfaces. What were these tunjos for, and what was their real value to Muisca society? If the Muiscans had valued tunjos as ornaments or jewelry, you would expect them to have a fine finish and you might also expect them to be buried with their owners as grave goods. Archaeologists studying Muisca gold face a common problem. Most of the gold was acquired from looters in the years when selling to the gold museum was legal. As a result, much of the archaeological context has been lost. But the looters' stories are consistent. The Tunjos weren't found in tombs, but in rivers and lakes, on mountaintops and in caves. The land north of Bogota is riddled with caves, just the sort of place where Tunjos were found. I met archaeologist Roberto Geras Perez, an expert on Muisca goldworking and belief systems. Thinking about metal within Muiscan society, what were the Muiscan using gold for? Well, gold was all important for Muisca, especially for votive offerings. They were thrown into lakes, inside caves, like the one in which we are now, or placed in fields, uh, sanctuaries, temples, uh, the foundations of houses, wherever it was important to place an object that would uh, restore equilibrium in cosmos. Try and explain Muiscan cosmology to me then. Well, Try to imagine the world as composed of opposite principles, opposite and complementary. So, first of all, you have man and woman. Then you have day and night, then you have up and down. So if you understand the world in this sense, you understand also that there is an equilibrium. Now, the, the point here is to understand that this is made by the gods, but you as a man, you can intervene in this equilibrium. So if there is any sort of alteration, say, for example, that you have three years in a row where there is no rain, you can intervene in there. How do you do that? With votive offerings, because this is a way to restore this principle that has been lost or diminished in the earth. And then you have the equilibrium and the conditions for life again. So it seems the Tunjo's actual purpose was as a shining gift to the gods to redress the balance of nature. Do you think Muiscan metalworking is unique in the way that it's created in South America? No other society, as far as I know, dedicated over 50% of their production for votive offerings. I think it's quite unique. It's incredible that with Muiscan metals, the entire lifetime of one object can be just days because it's created for a particular purpose to go straight into the ground. Uh, it seems to be a waste of time. But then, if you think that this was so important for society, much more important than having a beautiful woman wearing this object, then you understand why so much trouble had to be assumed in order to produce these objects. To the Moisca, gold appears not to have had any intrinsic value. And if its value is purely spiritual, it seems likely that every aspect of its creation, its shape, colour and what it represented, would have been part of a sacred process. How it was made was therefore critically important. Today, the secrets of that ancient craftsmanship have been preserved in a highly unlikely setting. Hola. 
do with them. Goldsmith Omar Hurtado doesn't so much take his work home with him as live with it. In his apartment in central Bogota, he has mastered the art of Muisca metalworking. It appears that the real skill is not in manipulating gold, but in knowing how to mold beeswax, a process known as the lost wax technique. Omar starts to shape the wax into a flat figurine. Moisca tujos were 2D representations of the human form. I asked Omar why the Moisca made flat tujos. Was it easier than making a 3D figure? I think it was a more easy dimension in terms of technique. But I think that they, igual, the pieces of the museum that one thinks are smooth, are much more easy. And really, the pieces of smooth have a more connotation that they can be presented with more tipo de malformaciones sí. en la fundición. Sí. O sea, realmente la pieza plana es una pieza muy compleja. The flat tunjos were made more complex by adding on the intricate details of face, arms, legs and bodily ornaments with wire-like threads of wax. Omar told me something really interesting. These colored waxes are industrial and represent different properties, different malleabilities that the wax has. To make one of these pieces, you need different types of wax with different types of malleability. And the Moisca used a whole range of different bees with different properties in their wax. Omar's just using this one, which is industrial, because he doesn't have time to go out on Sunday and collect bees from all over Colombia. But it's a really interesting fact that the Moisca were cultivating different types of bees specifically for this process. Once the beeswax figurine is completed, Omar bends it over and adds a network of little tubes. The tuncho will then be packed in clay and placed in an oven to evaporate the wax, leaving a mould into which the molten metal can be poured. The network of tubes ensures that the metal travels into every intricate detail of the figure. So our lovely little wax creation is now inside this piece of clay, which is going to go in the oven and the wax will evaporate, leaving the mould. Once the wax has gone, molten metal can be poured into the empty mould. The moisca could control the colour of the final piece by varying the relative quantities of copper and gold in the alloy. I love it that in an anonymous apartment block in Bogota, there's a guy wielding his acetylene torch, ready to burn the place down. Research suggests that the Moisca used fires rather than blowtorches. But it also tells us that those in charge of making these tunjos were far more than just simple craftsmen. It's possible that the tunjos were actually being made by the priests themselves that Muisca priests were masters of both ritual knowledge and practical skill. <laughs> so there's our little piece. The wax is all melted away, and also it's still flexed right round, and these tubes of metal which have been used to pour in the metal into the mould. We'll have to cut those off, and then we'll bend him back out and finish him off. Seeing this process up close, you can see why the Moisca pieces have these rough edges and these little bits of metal still stuck on the sides. The remnants of those tubes of metal coming down to fill the cast. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Omar. Bueno, encantado. Muchísimas gracias para todo, ¿no? Encantado. Y ese es el proceso. Se ha parecido muy bonita. Bueno, nos vemos, ¿eh? Muchas gracias. Chao, chao. Gracias. Gold's malleability made it the ideal material for creating a wide variety of small but intricate objects. Offerings to the gods were frequent, and so vast amounts of gold must have been needed. Given the importance of gold, the Spanish expected to find mines throughout the Muiscan territory. But it doesn't occur naturally here. All Muiscan gold had to be brought in from elsewhere. So how did they acquire so much of it? In Beer de Labour's market, people from the surrounding area come to buy food and other produce. 
500 years ago, the scene would have been very similar, with the difference that the Muisca didn't use money. Spanish chronicles describe a thriving barter system. Trade was crucial for Muiscan society. It gave them the chance to get the produce they needed of gold and cotton from the lowlands and bring it up here to the highlands where they could work it into secondary products that they could sell on. The Muisca economy was geared towards transforming raw materials brought in from outside into finished products. Cotton was used to make blankets that could then be traded in gold-producing regions beyond Muisca territory for the precious metal. But there was one commodity that the Muisca did have in abundance. A precious mineral so valuable that it could be exchanged directly for gold. In the hills north of Bogota are the mines of Nemecon, where deep below the ground lie rich deposits of one of the Muisca's greatest assets. Not precious gems or coal, but a mineral vital for life itself, salt. Deep underground and far from the coast isn't where I would expect to find salt, but a hundred million years ago, an ancient sea existed here. When the waters evaporated, they left behind vast plains of salt. Tectonic activity later raised these mountains and the salt flats were folded into the rocks, trapping huge pockets of the mineral beneath the earth. Entonces, ¿tienes esta evidencia de la tipo de mina que está, estaban haciendo la huesca? Sí, o sea, eh, literalmente encima de, de, de la mina. My guide, Edwin, explained that in modern times, miners bore deep into the mountains in search of the salt. But the Muisca didn't need to dig. Rain would fall through hills of salt, like this one, and they would collect the salt water from the streams at the bottom of the hill, pour the water into big clay jars and heat them up to evaporate off the water. Gradually, these clay pots would fill with salt, and they'd smash them and be left with a salt cake. Salt cake production became a major industry for the Muisca, giving them the economic power to amass the gold that they needed. But the Muisca's great strength would also expose them to danger. It was salt cakes being traded up and down the Magdalena River, and the sort of production, the industrial production that it showed, that drew the conquistadors up into the Muisca heartlands. A Spanish chronicler recorded the moment when conquistador Jiménez de Quesada decided to change course. Seeing the excellent nature of the land and how the Indians always brought us salt, which they packed into large blocks, Jiménez decided to try to seek its source. The salt trail led the Spanish directly to the Muisca. With a fragmented structure of chiefdoms in the northern and southern confederations, the Muisca were unable to mount serious resistance to the conquistadors. In a little over a year, the whole of the Muisca territory was under Spanish control. Violence and old world diseases took their toll and the population crashed. The Muisca were a people with a completely different value system to their Spanish conquerors are people in tune with their environment and the world around them. Communities held together by rituals and celebrations. And a society for whom the real value of gold was in what it could achieve by being offered to the gods. But the Muisca were so completely overrun by the invaders that contemporary echoes of their past are hard to find. Unless you know where to look. This is Tejo. It's actually 
the national sport of Colombia and one of the few pieces of Muiscan identity that has survived into modern Colombia. The idea is to get this piece of iron within this circular ring. But even this game is dominated by a Spanish influence. The Spanish decided to liven it up by putting some gunpowder here, which you've got to try and hit and explode. Today, in a country with around 85 different ethnic groups, Moiskan blood and culture survive only as faint echoes. We lost this one, but I think we're going to start another game. The Moiska had fallen, but they were not alone. Further north, along the Magdalena River, lived another connected culture, the Tyrona. Their future would be very different. I'm making my way towards the mountains of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, along the Caribbean coast, to find out how and why. Rivers are the lifeblood of trade, allowing goods to flow freely between the coast and the interior. For the Muisca, the Magdalena had been the source of much of their gold. But some of that precious metal was also traded north to the Tyrona. The Tyrona shared gold working skills and a language with the Muisca, but they lived in a very different environment. Did they also share the same beliefs? This is the land of the Tyrona. From here on the Caribbean coast, the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta rises up to 5,700 metres, the highest coastal range in the world. High up in those mountains are scattered the lost cities of the Tyrona. Archaeology in this sort of terrain, where everything is covered by a thick carpet of vegetation, is enormously difficult. New discoveries are rare. But in the 1970s, a flood of Tyrona gold and other artefacts started to appear on the black market. The first clues that looters were working on a new Tyrona site. When archaeologists reached the location high in the mountains, they were amazed. It was the largest and most impressive Tyrona site ever discovered. It was given the name Ciudad Perdida, the lost city. Getting to Ciudad Perdida on foot is a three-day hike through these dense forested mountains. Today, I'm hitching a lift with the Colombian army, and it's giving me a wonderful perspective on the lost city. From the air, I can really appreciate the size and remoteness of this site. So many of the South American sites are in straight lines, but this site clings to the mountainsides using the contours of the hills. I can see the terraces covered in vegetation. It only leads to the imagination how big this site must be. To put Ciudad Perdida in perspective, archaeologists have estimated that it is 10 times larger than the famous Inca ruins of Machu Picchu in Peru. Even though most of it is hidden by thick vegetation, it's still breathtaking when you consider the effort that was needed to build a city in this terrain. Archaeologists have only just begun to scratch the surface, but they are finding some really exciting evidence of what this place was once like. Santiago Geraldo is leading the excavations. What dates does this site have, do you think? Okay, the earliest date that we have here is a 650 AD date, and that's, that's what I found do, during my research. Those dates uh, really resonate with me, with this idea we're getting lots of cultures rising up, these Chibcha-speaking cultures, and it's a very similar time period to when the Muisca mm. rise up. The, the time when these periods are rising up maps out quite well, say, with the classic period of Mesoamerica. And then the, the Maya collapse around 900 to 1000 AD, but these guys just keep on going. It's thought that Ciudad Perdida was occupied for almost a thousand years. 
existing in parallel with Muisca society. But while very little remains of Muisca architecture, here the Tirona structures have lasted remarkably well, leaving clear evidence of how they were constructed. So here we have a, a, a classic Tirona wall. Now the stone shows up really nicely. You can get this really nice faced edge mm -hmm. coming down. Mm -hmm. It looks really good. And this must stuff goes on for miles. Looking at the steepness of these mountain slopes, how do you think that the Tyrona coped with that, with their architecture? So, really, what's at a premium here for these societies is flat areas. And what they were doing with all the terracing was actually creating flat, livable space. Now, one of the main difficulties is that these people used no mortar. So, what they did was a combination of masonry and rammed earth. And that's what makes them incredibly stable. And also the fact that they overlapped one terrace to the other. So you create step-like platforms. And that's what really um, creates stability in an area such as this one, because you've got over 4,000 millimeters of rainfall. And that means that a terrace can be washed away if it's not really stable. Working in harmony with the landscape, the Tyrona created a thriving city. It's extraordinary that salt, cotton and gold from the lowlands were traded up here, around a thousand metres above sea level. These stone terraces provided stable foundations for large wooden structures that would have been at the centre of communal life in the city. These platforms look fantastic. The size of them, the monumentality, do you think this is a particularly special part of the site? Oh, absolutely. We've got the uh, main feasting gathering area over there and excavation work that I did in 2006. What we found was that most of the trash that was being deposited was drinking cups, serving jars, and big trays. That pretty much spells out feasts and feasting for the most part. Um, and then you've got adjacent structures that probably served as kitchens. What do you think the role of that feasting was here? Do you think it's a display or, or um, chiefly status? As, as in most human societies, the uh, politics of commensality are exceedingly important. They're, they're extremely, extremely important just for creating allies. Uh, there's work feasts. There's um, when you've got a new trading partner coming in, of course you want to impress him. Ritual feasts strengthen social relationships within the Chibcha-speaking community and beyond. During the 16th century, we found evidence that chiefs here were actually trading gold objects for wine with French and English pirates that, that were bringing in wine. So feasting definitely played a hugely important role in these societies. A variety of different produce was grown at different elevations. But these bountiful slopes were steep and thick with vegetation. Moving large quantities any distance must have been a real challenge. To see how they did it, I'm heading back down to the coast. As with the Muisca, the secret of Tyrona's success came from their mastery of their environment. Centuries-old routes once connected all Tyrona settlements. This network of pathways hundreds of miles long allowed people to transport goods back and forth between the coast and the mountains. The path I'm following leads to Pueblito, a Tyrona settlement first inhabited almost 1,500 years ago. I've come to meet anthropologist Lorena Aja Slava, who has been investigating the significance of the paths and what they can tell us. Hay caminos que son pequeños, eh, o que pueden estar, por ejemplo, como escaleras, ¿cierto?, en ciertas partes, y hay otros caminos que son mucho más amplios para la circulación de mayor cantidad de población, que es lo que encontramos aquí en Pueblito, eh, zonas en donde ya son pues calles ¿sí? que implican o nos pueden eh, indicar que había una población importante que se reunía en este lugar. 
But the paths weren't simply an indication of population size and mobility. They were designed to literally support Tyrona society. La, hay algo muy importante que comprender de la ubicación de la Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta para entender cómo fueron construidos los caminos y lo que significó en la adaptación ambiental de estas poblaciones al territorio. Eh, en las temporadas de lluvias eh, es muchísima el agua. Entonces, parte de lo que desarrollan las estructuras de los caminos son eh, permitir que no haya una erosión fuerte por la lluvia. ¿sí? Y para mí, con este tipo de visión, me puede ver un mundo Tairona que es ampliado por toda la sierra, que tiene vínculos entre las diferentes partes del medio ambiente. ¿Eso es lo mismo para usted? Sí, hay, hay algo muy importante y es que las poblaciones a través, en ese periodo que hablamos, pero que es algo que se ha mantenido en el tiempo, eh, de un manejo del territorio a través del conocimiento de cómo funciona la sierra. Entonces, el conocimiento que ha trascendido durante todos estos años está es en el territorio, en reconocer, aprender, observar el territorio, cómo se dan los cambios. So like the Moisca, the Tyrona were perfectly in tune with their environment, knowing how to use its resources without damaging the world around them. Evidence that this was a spiritual connection is preserved in one of the rocks near the center of the town, where priests gathered to predict the future. These pools for divination were used by the Tyrona. They would drop a bead inside the water and watch how the bubbles came up. That would help them with complex decisions they were due to make. Archaeologists believe that many of those decisions would be connected to the Tyrona's worship of the natural world. Just as there is evidence of sun worship amongst the Moisca, so too was the sun revered by the Tyrona. All objects that captured or reflected the light of the sun were valued. Shimmering water, shiny stones, snow-capped mountains, and the glinting colors of the forest. One material in particular didn't just reflect light, it was the same color as the sun as well. Gold. Just like the Moisca, whose gold gave rise to the legend of El Dorado, the Tyrona held the precious metal in high esteem. Under the guidance of archaeologist Juanita Sainz Sampa, museum curators are cleaning Tyrona artifacts. What's immediately striking about these objects is that they have been burnished and polished smooth, quite unlike the rough edged artifacts made by the Muisca. Looking at these pieces of Tyrona metal, what are the similarities and differences between Muisca and Tyrona metalwork? Well, there are a lot of differences. You know, because the, the Muisca people didn't polish their pieces and these Tyrona people were so great polishing and finishing every single details because they just use it for another thing. The, the Muisca Tunjos were not used for wearing on, on you and these kind of, of um, uh, objects were used to wear, were used to, to say, hey, I'm the boss. Muiscan goldsmiths made offerings to the gods. Tyrona gold also had spiritual value because it reflected the sun that gave life. But rather than make unique pieces like the Moisca, the Tyrona craftsmen perfected symbols that were reproduced time and time again. What were the important symbols within Tyrona well, culture? Birds, birds with open wings, which are these ones, and also the Batman. The Batman is a very important symbolic icon in Tyrona iconography. Creatures like the Batman, half human, half animal, are common in Tyrona art. It feels like another illustration of the close connection between the human and natural worlds. So it seems that the link between gold and nature was just as important to the Tyrona as it was to the Moisca. But Tyrona craftsmanship wasn't just restricted to gold. At the University of Magdalena in Santa Marta, archaeologist Angelica Nunes is working on a collection of remarkable ceramic objects. Sí, 
Entonces, ¿estos artefactos vienen de sitios Tairona? Sí, todos vienen de sitios Tairona, eh, piezas arqueológicas y materiales que no son artefactos, son materiales originarios de cada región hacia la sierra. Thousands of different pieces of pottery have been collected here. They provide an invaluable insight into Tairona life and beliefs. And some of the symbols I saw in the gold artifacts are here too. Y en esta pieza aquí tenemos una cosa muy interesante. Sí, pues aquí podemos identificar con bastante precisión las facciones de un murciélago y también obviamente la posición antropomórfica. Eh, sus patas, sus extremidades son de, también de otro animal. Que este era un símbolo como de fertilidad eh, por su posición y por eh, la representación de, de las ranas y y los murciélagos que están muy ligados a la sexualidad, a la reproducción. As ever, the connection with the natural world is very evident. But there was a particular piece of pottery that captured my attention. Y mirando estas piezas, me puede ver a este aquí, me gusta mucho, que, que parece que tienen algo en la, en la mejilla. Sí, sí, podemos hacer la asociación certeramente y eh, la bola siempre va a ser un indicador de mambé. Este vínculo entre el uso de coca y la gente tairona y la gente indígena es cosa muy interesante, ¿no? Y a mirar la, en dentro de la cerámica es cosa muy buena. Sí, y es todo una, un imaginario, toda una cosmogonía que se representa en la cerámica, pero también está muy ligada al trance que se adquiere con el mambeo de la coca. Angelica's understanding of Tyrona beliefs isn't based on the artifacts alone. She's been working closely with indigenous people who could be the last remaining link with the Tyrona. I'm heading back into the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta to visit them. The Kogi, an indigenous community of around 12,000 people, live in small mountain villages not far from the Tyrona sites of Pueblito and Ciudad Perdida. Living separately from contemporary society, they've preserved their traditional way of life and they guard their independence fiercely. So it's a huge privilege to be invited into their village for the day. Most Kogi still speak a language derived from Chibcha, the tongue of the Tyrona and the Muisca. My guide Jacinto is one of the very few who also speaks Spanish. I asked him if he felt that his people were connected to the Tyrona. No ven aquí como ven a los miembros de la comunidad, ya los mamo. Todavía siguen haciendo su, su, sus casas como desde el principio, como, como era la forma de la construcción de la casa. Jacinto invited me to help in the building of a new house for the mamos, the Kogi spiritual leaders. There's a deep cultural connection here with the environment one that seems to echo the philosophy of the Tyrona. I can easily imagine these houses sitting on the round stone terraces at Pueblito or Ciudad Perdida. One of the ceremonies that will be carried out in this house is the initiation ceremony when a boy turns into a man. At that point, they'll be given a gourd and coca leaves. And as you'll see, the men here all chew coca. This is an essential part of Kogi life. It's impossible to know whether the Tyrona had the same rite of passage, but coca chewing recurs again and again in their pottery. The connections are clear to see. When Kogi men meet, they exchange coca leaves. They're repeatedly extracting lime from a gourd known as a poporo and wiping it across the wad of coca leaves in their mouths to release the active ingredients. Cocaine is derived from the coca plant, but raw coca leaves don't have the same powerful narcotic effect. 
Kogi men chew it as a mild stimulant that helps them to communicate with their ancestors. These traditions, passed from generation to generation, continue the Kogi's deep spiritual connection with their environment. Everything that goes into the construction of these houses has to come from a seed. This is because they see themselves as seeds of the Sierra, that humans need to be nurtured and grown just like plants. So in these houses, we start to see a connection between how they're constructed and the Kogi idea that people and environment are one. The Kogi assert a sense of their own history and beliefs that is inseparable from the land, the same land that sustained the Tyrona. Today, Kogi culture is alive in part because of the protection offered by the mountains the same mountains that protected the Tyrona nearly 500 years ago. Unlike the Muisca, the Tyrona were never completely overrun by the Spanish. The geography of their homeland made it difficult for the conquistadors to penetrate far. But Spanish colonization of the valleys stifled trade between the villages of the mountains and wave upon wave of old world disease decimated the population. Eventually, all that remained of the Tyrona were dwindling communities scattered in the mountains. They and the Muisca seemed to vanish. But they didn't. From Bogota to the Sierra Nevada, I have witnessed the legacy of these cultures. It's still living in the remains of their architecture, in their artifacts rich with meaning, in the gold that connected the Tyrona and the Muisca to their spiritual beliefs. The Spanish, Lured by the myth of El Dorado, plundered the gold. But they couldn't destroy the beliefs shared by the two cultures. Beliefs that live on with the Kogi today. An unshakable faith in community and the value of their environment above all else, even gold. For me, these are the treasures Kipling wrote of, hidden behind the ranges. <laughs>